So today we're joined by Kim Daniels. I have Paul. Oh, that's not it. <laughs> today we are joined by Kim Daniels. Um, I apologize for bringing her in, but she's going to join us for about 20 minutes, and I'm so sorry, honey, for cutting you off. Uh -huh. um, but Kim has a bachelor's from UCSD in visual arts and English literature and a master's from broadcast journalism uh, in broadcast journalism at USC, which is where we met. She's worked on Dirty Jobs, she's worked on The Bachelor and The Bachelor Pad, and she's worked on Ghost Hunters. She's currently the digital producer at Marriage Boot Camp. Yay! So, here, let's switch back over so that sound doesn't sound so horrible. All right, fabulous. <laughs> So um, let's jump right into it. Actually, I would really like you to start with what a digital producer is. Right. So a digital producer is kind of a new um, thing these days, and networks are really experimenting with what that means. But in this case, uh, the network gives me a list of things that they want from set that they think that they're going to use online, which could be set stills, behind-the-scenes information, uh, special interviews with the cast members that won't go on television. Uh, we also, on this show, we have like a confession cam uh, that is mostly going to be used as online content, but sometimes will be uh, used in the television show. And um, basically, I'm the only one in my department, and I just go around like a madwoman uh, collecting all of this stuff. So I've got a I've got a video camera, I've got a still camera, and then I'm also writing bios, um, doing interviews, and stuff like that. So it's kind of a one man band thing, but um, with a decent amount of support from the production. Okay, I'm gonna sit over here so that we All right. can see the class. Um, so how did you get into this? So the digital producer thing, um, I started doing kind of television production in high school and I've always done the tech thing um, and then I became, I did camera for a bit and then I became a story producer and one of the um, higher ups that I was working with, she saw the need for this, you know, the network came down and was like, we need somebody who can do X, Y, and Z. She happened to know my background and she was like, I thought about you for this project so are you interested? And I said, well, yeah, because everything's going to web and um, it's not super formalized yet, but having experience of doing something like a digital producer is uh, basically a title that you can spin any way you want because uh, there's nothing, you know, nobody really knows what kind of role that is. And so, you know, for me, it was a good experiment to interface with the network on something like this because surprisingly enough or maybe not surprisingly networks are not terribly sophisticated about how they interact online uh, but I wanted experience in that space uh, and so I took the job. So when you say that networks are not terribly sophisticated can you elaborate on that? So what have networks been doing and what do you think they should be doing and how do you get there? <coughs> Well, so networks know, much like the transition of newspapers from print to online, television networks know that they have to provide content through the web. And some of the more progressive networks probably know that, you know, uh, that cable is ending sooner than later. So they are jumping into the space of web to engage their audiences you know, on many different levels and social, not just providing content, but also getting them to interact with that content in social media. But because it's still so new, there's not a lot of people with expertise out there. So, you know, in this particular case, uh, with WeTV, which is the network that shows Marriage Bootcamp, um, they've, you know, they've hired basically bloggers. They've hired people who have just been in that digital space for a long time. But, for example, I did work with somebody who is an executive, and I said the word clickbait, and he had never heard that term before, which I thought was really shocking for someone who is the director of digital content for a cable network. Yeah, that's pretty shocking. We talk about clickbait yeah. a lot. Yeah. 
Can you talk a little bit about what a story producer is and how that evolved into digital producer? Because unfortunately, you got cut off, and I really wanted you to hear what we were talking about regarding. Yeah, I know. Me too. <laughs> yeah. So um, as a story producer in reality television, which is a pretty standard position on any television show you see uh, for unscripted, unscripted television, commonly reality television, basically um, the story producer will, while in pre-production, will kind of uh, look at the subject matter that we're dealing with and track out what kind of story beats we can expect for every episode based on what we know we're making a show about. So for example, um, Dirty Jobs was a procedural. We'd, we'd find a job and then you'd say, all right, there's a beginning, you know, you're making charcoal. So, you know, the, the beginning is that you're cutting up all this wood and you're putting it in a fire and then the middle is that you're like turning it around and at the end is you're putting it in a bag. So, you know, as a story producer, you'd be like, all right, identify what is the beginning, middle, and the end. Uh, in a show like Marriage Boot Camp, what you're doing is, during production, you're tracking the story arc. So in Marriage Boot Camp, you're being, you have an entire cast being put into this kind of, you know, fake situation. They're all living in a house together and going through group therapy together. And so while that production is happening, the story producer is sitting in the control room and keeping track of everything that's going on so that they can identify that same stuff, the beginning, middle, and end of a, of a story for each episode of that show. And then after production is over, the story producer goes into post-production and works very closely with the editor, usually making string outs, uh, which is like a very rough edit of an episode, works closely with the editor to make that episode of television. Does that make sense? I think so, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, how did you get into doing this? It really sounds that you, uh, I'd like for you to talk a little bit about um, how, all right, let me rephrase that. You seem to have your fingers in a different, in a lot of different areas in the industry. How did you get to that point and how did you build skill sets to give you this very unique title? Yeah. So when I started in reality television, which was one of my first jobs in LA, it was really the result. I started as a researcher, which was really the result of some friends from college having worked in reality for a few years. Um, I had, right after undergrad, I went to Japan with the JET program. And so when I came back, everybody had been working for a couple years, and it was kind of a natural fit. Um, you know, I'd always done production. I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do next. I, I was pretty sure I wanted to go to graduate school. So I kind of, I needed to take some time to figure that out. In the meantime, I took these jobs in television because it was just what was there and what I'd always been interested in. I'd always wanted to do documentary. I'd always wanted to work for Discovery Channel. And, um, you know, it was just an opportunity I had. And then uh, when I transitioned into camera, Again, it was because one of my best friends was a camera operator. She was going with The Bachelor to Rome for two months, and she was like, it would be way more fun if you would come, and I'll, I knew how to use the cameras, and so um, you know, I did that for a while. When I decided that I wanted to go to grad school in journalism, it was because I really wanted to focus on storytelling. I knew I didn't want to make a career out of the technical job of operating a camera, and so uh, I went to graduate school in journalism, really kind of just focused on the storytelling skills and then, um, you know, with the hope of doing some documentary but knowing that I would be mostly in uh, unscripted television. And when I came out of grad school, I went back to camera because it was, you know, most of the connections I had, but I gradually over the next year or so um, started doing story work, which which I got because of people I knew from my connections in the camera world. Um, so that it was, I feel like it was a really natural progression. It just happens to be the best fit for me within that industry. Okay, well let's just pull the audience. The audience. We'll pull the class real quick so you can see what okay. kind of uh, work the students are interested in. Uh, how many of you are interested in? Uh, 
television, in producing television. All right, so we've got some hands over here as well. Uh, and how many of you are interested in documentary filmmaking? Okay, so also a couple hands. And how many of you are interested in new media advertising and PR? Oh, there you go, right? So I only asked that other question because even though it seems that Kim is focusing on content, on reality content and uh, documentary, you know, turning reality into documentary, um, all of these pieces that are being asked of her are coming from the social media department. So, could Sorry, you, yeah, I didn't add that, the digital producer thing, yeah. Yeah, no, that's fine. Could you elaborate a little bit more on uh, getting requests for bits, uh, digital bits, and how that fits into telling the story of what's happening in Marriage Boot Camp? Right, so, um, so because I am the digital producer for Marriage Boot Camp, um, I'm in the story department, but I the, the only reason I really interface with story department is to know when I can like run into a scene and grab someone and get them to do one of the things that I need them to do which would be these extra um, digital bits and uh, those requests come from the network before we start shooting so it's a long list I have like this spreadsheet that I just kind of click off uh, and then throughout the season the other thing that we look for is if anything pops that um, that is definitely not going to make the television show but would be something funny for um, for the web so for example in this last series does anybody know the show Jersey Shore <coughs> one of the characters from Jersey Shore was on the marriage boot camp and so uh, you know something funny that they did was all the other characters started doing impressions of him and you know something super cute never gonna make television but you know for fans of these people they might go to the website and be like oh you know it's funny that they were cracking each other up with impressions of, them from, of each other so then I'll identify things like that and I'll, in post I'll go and pull that stuff and I'll give that to the network and they can use it online uh, can you tell us a little bit about this uh, clip that I showed that I wasn't supposed to? Uh, the gift <laughs> of this fellow, which I'm going to click over while you're talking. Yeah. So, um, you know, another thing I do is follow them around oh, with the camera. camera. No, hold on, hold on, pause. Okay. Sorry. Push. Come on, button. Thank you. My bad. Okay, you're back. Uh, go ahead and tell us a little bit about it. I'll pull it up right now. Okay, so, you know, that was from uh, uh, last year from a season of Marriage Boot Camp. I follow them all around with a camera, and sometimes they do really funny things. This guy happened to uh, be drinking too much, and he started dancing in the bar that we were at. He's a bodybuilder. It was kind of a funny scene. So I just popped off some shots of him doing it and decided, you know, to make an animated GIF so that would be an option for the digital team if they wanted to kind of put out something that would be entertaining for people, maybe share if they were fans of the show, because um, animated GIFs are also very small, that's the trick with them. That one's uh, 1 1.6 megabytes, but usually they're like one megabyte. And so that's something that you can put up on your Tumblr, you can put up on your Twitter, you can email it, you can text message it, um, you know, and it's a kind of a funny thing. You know, they could have put text on it, or, or whatever and, and tag Marriage Boot Camp and it would be a, you know, an audience uh, interaction tool, interactivity tool. Okay, uh, that window is coming up unfortunately, but I'll work it out. Uh, my computer's failed me today. Oh no. So, uh, can you tell us a little bit about why you enjoy, what you do and why you enjoy doing it? And actually hold that thought because I'm, I want to load the GIF because it's here now. Um, this one, All right? So uh, we're watching this now, just so you can see it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it was pretty much just a piece of extra content. How many of you go online looking for pieces of extra content for your favorite shows, your favorite musicians, your favorite parties, right? This is everybody, even though sometimes when I ask, you know, did you do it for a specific television show, you might say no, but we are in this need for more information. We want to use media to gratify this need. 
So going back to my other question, Kim, uh, mm -hmm. how how did you what do you what do you enjoy about what you do, and why do you why do you continue to do it? Um, well, I think you know going back to the story producer thing. Basically, my goal is to continue to practice storytelling with it. When it's with reality television, we have a lot of different examples of how to put together a story in reality. Sometimes it's scripted, sometimes it's soft scripted, sometimes it's truly documentary, and so you you know you really have to practice the skills. At the end of the day, you're putting together a story, and so you have to keep those skills sharp, and um, and that's what I enjoy about it—the challenge of of you know taking a ton of footage and boiling it down into 30 minutes or 45 minutes and, and trying to make it interesting. Uh, with the digital stuff, I really enjoy it because it is new and you can get more creative, you can play around with um, your ideas about, about how you're going to engage the audience online and, and uh, because it's less formal, uh, there's really no rules yet. So that kind of stuff is fun, and there's been a lot more opportunities lately. You know, I've kind of randomly gotten calls from DreamWorks uh, and and different networks like that to produce content for the web. A girlfriend of mine is doing branded content for the web, where she's making like very short webisodes. She happens to be working for a company called TasteMade, where they do like cooking shows. And within that cooking show, they incorporate whatever brand they're doing. So right now, she's working with like a credit card company. And um, when they in their in their television show, they visit restaurants in different cities. And then at one or two of the restaurants, they're gonna you know like swipe the credit card. And it's not super focused, but you know it's there and you know it happens. And that's the branding right there. But the rest of it is really a show about you know these cool restaurants in different cities. So um, and that's like six to eight minutes for the internet. Um, you know, super new. People still kind of look down on it. For some reason, the web is still the redheaded stepchild in the production world, even though I think TV is going to go out with, like the dinosaurs. But you know, um, so 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 that space is it's you can experiment, and there's a there's a lot of opportunity for innovation there. So you talked about uh, getting calls from DreamWorks. Does that mean you work as a freelance? Uh, work in. Yeah, as freelance, as a freelance um, contractor, producer. Contractor. There we go. Thank you. Yeah. Um, how is that working for you? What opportunities does that give you that you uh, that other people might not know? Yeah. So um, a lot of media is freelance. There's not a ton of staff jobs out there if you're in television. Um, basically, what it means is you work contract to contract. As a story producer for one episode or one season of television, you're generally going to be working for about three months, three to four months. Um, but what it means is that you have to keep your network very tight because you're always going to be looking for your next job. It is not for everyone. Um, it doesn't mean that there aren't staff jobs out there, but it's much more common for people to be freelance in this industry. Um, and for me, I like it because it means I can change projects all the time. If I am working with people that I don't like very much, if I'm working with content I don't like very much, after three or four months, it's over. I move on. You know, um, but the instability can be tough. So uh, I'm, I'm sorry that we ended up uh, starting late, but mm -hmm. looking at my list of questions, I feel like we've hit most of them, so that's exciting. Good. Let me ask you one more question, and then we'll open it up for class questions. Um, what advice do you have for students considering this area of the industry, even though the title itself is kind of nebulous and very new? So two sides to that question. One, any advice you have for students interested in uh, television? And two, advice you have for students who are interested in producing digital content? Yeah. So um, the advice that I have for you guys is to be very specific with what you want. Um, for anyone who's interested in working, actually in, in any media for that matter, uh, print, radio, television, uh, really try and focus in as much as you can on, on what it, position it is that you want to have because that's the only way that you're going to find somebody who can help you get there because 
it, this is the same for any industry. It's going to be really important um, that you make good contacts and and utilize those relationships and for getting jobs. And that means with each other as well. But in any case, it's be really specific. If you want to work in television and you know you want to be a DP someday, uh, you get a PA job on set, and when somebody asks you what do you want to do, you say, I want to be a DP. And that is the way that you can meet people who are like, all right, I want to help you, and, and they will kind of pull you up through the ranks. If you want to be an executive producer, if you want to be a story producer, or whatever it is that you want to do, you're going to have to start as a production assistant, uh, unless you're real lucky, and then um, be specific every day and let people know that you're eager and you want to work hard, and, and you can move up pretty quickly. So I will tell you, I know people who have been a PA for five to seven years, because they were never specific. Um, I was never a PA. I got lucky, but a standard PA, you shouldn't be a PA for more than a year if you are ambitious and know what you want to do. Uh, what are some of the mistakes? You t when we talked, you told me of a great mistake. I would love for you to share that with the students. Oh, which one? <laughs> oh, being vague. Oh, yeah, being vague. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, a something that's really common on set, and this goes for scripted as well if anybody's interested in that stuff, is you'll go up to a PA and you'll be like, so what is it that you want to do? And the PA will be like, well, you know, I really love camera, but audio is also really cool, but then I think like I love to produce and direct and write, and you're like, yeah, so join the club and I have no idea what I can do to help you, so I'm going to go ask this other person who maybe knows what they want. Um, it's just, it's a really common occurrence, and those are the people who are PAs for five to seven years. It's like, they don't know what they want, they don't know how to express it, and so for me, as somebody who could help you, I'm like, well, you're a little too vague, and I can't, like, I'm not going to hand you over to somebody if you are saying you love camera just as much as you love, uh, you know, producing, because though there are positions for that, it's like, when you're starting out, you need to be very, very, very specific. So on that note, in our last couple minutes, are there any questions? Maybe we have a question for Kim. All right, Sean's got a question. Fabulous. Uh, Sean, can you come up here and ask just so that we don't have audio problems? Oh, yeah, and while you're walking up, the, the other recommendation I have is if you want to work in television, find out the producers who are making the content that you love. So um, you can always Google search that. It's, it's always a production company that is making content for a network. Um, Kim, you said that um, TV is going to go out like the dinosaurs, and why do you say that, and should I be worried for so as someone who is, aspires to be a broad broadcaster on t television? Yeah, what, are you, are you talking sports broadcaster? Yeah, yeah, primarily sports broadcasting. Well, you know, I, um, I say that because uh, subscription cable is, is as, as you guys are growing up and becoming the main market, you are not experiencing media in the same way that like traditionally my generation has, which is through a cable subscription, right? You have all of these other avenues for media. And one of the only things that's really keeping television around right now is sports. Once sports is out how to provide their own content and ditch the cable companies, like, it's really all over. Um, I don't think you should be worried as somebody who wants to be a broadcaster. Uh, there's always going to be a market for that kind of stuff. But what you do need to look at is uh, be comfortable with the online space. For example, have your own video podcast, have your own blog, um, get used to being a personality, start branding yourself now because what's going to be important is your immediate audience, the immediate audience that you can reach as somebody who's being hired for a network. They're going to look at your Twitter followers, and they're going to be like, whoa, you have tw five Twitter followers? I guess you don't really care that much about engaging your audience. So you're going to be much less likely to have a job if you're not comfortable in the social media space. If you have your own personal brand, which is so great, you guys are undergrads now, you can spend all your time at school really defining that brand. If you have a personal brand, a broadcaster is going to be more likely to hire you. And I think, you know, they, we used to use the word like tastemakers or something like that. The buzzword right now for digital content is um, influencers. Uh, so, you know, become an influencer. Get into that community that you're interested in and be a voice. And that's what's going to get you noticed, and that's what's going to get you a job. 
Awesome. On that note, uh, I suppose we will call it a day. I apologize for cutting you short because there were a couple other questions, so you might get some emails from students. Feel free to email me. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Can I get a round of applause for students? <laughs> and I'll see you in like four weeks. Yeah. I'll take awesome. you to dinner. <laughs> great. Bye, girl. Bye. Have a great day. No, I got five.